Few personalities are as polarizing even after their death as the former leader of Libya, Muammar Gaddafi. Some saw him as a pan-African bulwark against Western imperialism, others as an eccentric dictator with fantasies of world domination. Either worshipped or hated, there was nothing in between. He ruled Libya for 42 years, first as the leader of a military junta, then of a socialist state, which in the course of time took on increasingly authoritarian features. First, he was a pan-Arabist, then a pan-Africanist. First, the poor Bedouin son, then the king of the kings of Africa, with billions of dollars, plus a personality cult. In the year of his death, 80% of the Libyan population knew no other leader. He was omnipresent, and everything in the country was connected to him. As I said, a figure who continues to divide minds. Just like the events surrounding his death due to the UN's interference in the Libyan civil war and the infamous 1973 resolution. It all started in Sirte, where Muammar was probably born in 1942 as the son of a shepherd. The Axis powers has just been pushed out of North Africa and the British and Free French forces were dividing the former Italian colony among themselves. In 1951, when little Muammar was probably nine years old, Libya was declared a monarchy and officially granted independence. The installed king Idris I was despised by Libyan patriots because he was seen as a puppet of the Americans and the British who had enormous military bases in Libya. Muammar, therefore, knew Libya only as an enslaved country until his youth. Discontent spread among the population, especially after the appearance of the new king of oil, because the wealth generated from it only benefited the small class of nouveau riche. The black gold made Libya one of the most prosperous states in Africa, and even Gaddafi, as the later leader of the state, will still supply the American oil companies despite his inflammatory speeches. Muammar is by now 19 years old in 1963, attends the military academy in Benghazi and has an idol, Gamal Abdel Nasser, Egyptian independence hero, representative of pan-Africanism and political pop star of the 1950s. Following his example, Gaddafi and his group of rebellious non-commissioned officers take advantage of the absence of the king in 1969, who is currently taking a cure in Turkey and apparently no one is missing, to take power in the country through a military coup, the whole operation without bloodshed. <laughs> But how should a country, which had always lived under some kind of foreign rule, be governed in the following? And how should it position itself in the struggle of the bloc states? Gaddafi presented his idea of a world order in his Green Book. It was a theoretical attempt to overcome the opposition between capitalism and communism. This third theory, meaning neither left nor right, but according to him, straight ahead, could be followed by learning from the mistakes of both ideologies. He was too much of a Muslim for the atheist Marxism and too anti-imperialist for the exploitive Manchester capitalism. The goal was a pan-Arab state based on an interpretation cleaned Islam. So much for the theory. In fact, according to Gaddafi, the greatest enemy of a peaceful world was the USA, a fact he frequently and gladly proclaimed. The response of the USA, the bombing of Tripoli in 1986, a lesson for Gaddafi with greetings from Ronald Reagan. For Gaddafi did not stick to his planned non-alignment and in 1972 converted Libya into a socialist planned economy. The great socialist people's Libyan Arab Jamahiria, a tongue twister meant to say the Republic of the Masses, and to create a monstrous construct a la Mao Zedong. Thousands of people's committees were founded. Their goal, the purge and extermination of the declared deviants and corrupt, the bourgeois, the pro-Western agents, Marxists and Islamists of the Muslim Brotherhood faith. The human rights situation was accordingly lousy. Freedom of the press and freedom of expression did not exist. Gaddafi was omnipresent in all media. The Libyan Domestic Intelligence Service, ISA, maintained two prisons of its own, Abu Salim and Ain Sara. In Abu Salim, 1,200 prisoners were executed executed without trial in 1996 after a prisoner uprising. However, he kept this to himself until 2004 and in the meantime took care of his flagship project, the construction of the great man-made river, which was supposed to provide drinking water to the Libyan desert and in the meantime was also able to improve the standard of living in the dry regions. The mega project swallowed up enormous sums of money that were lacking elsewhere. At the same time, the population increased rapidly in the 90s 
and the UN embargo increasingly took the press out of its country. After all, in terms of foreign policy, Gaddafi's Libya was a red flag for the UN, as it repeatedly supported attacks directed against the USA and Israel. The most famous example is the attack on Pan American Flight 103 in 1988, which, with 189 American civilians killed, was considered the worst attack on the USA until 9-11. The decision in the West was clear. The sky has to disappear. In 1998, a bomb in Gaddafi's escort was detonated. With the financial support of the British MI6, Gaddafi remained unharmed, but it would later become clear that no name can be erased from the West's death note. At some point, Gaddafi would also have his turn. UN sanctions and domestic challenges put Libya in a precarious position in the late 1990s. Discontent was growing at home, and as mentioned, Gaddafi had more enemies than friends abroad as well. Why was he not overthrown already here? On the one hand, of course, it was due to the merciless cruelty of his repressive apparatus. But on the other hand, he was able to extend for a long time the popularity he sparked at the beginning of his reign. But he was not only the crazy and eccentric despot, but also a clever tactician. How else could he have stayed in power for 42 years? To free himself from UN sanctions, Libya admitted involvement in the Lockerbie bombing and UTA Flight 772, after which the embargo was lifted in 2003. He banned several terrorist organizations from the country as a sign of goodwill, including being one of the first to issue an international arrest warrant for Osama bin Laden. The EU benefited from cooperation to keep African refugees away from its external borders. The conditions to which the people were then subjected in the detention camps were knowingly ignored. Gaddafi took a further step forwards the West when he agreed to dismantle his weapons of mass destruction in 2003, a significant step that would later prove fatal for him. He was a welcome guest at the international political banquet in the 2000s, meeting Gerhard Schröder, Nicolas Sarkozy and Silvio Berlusconi. None of these politicians are really respectable anymore. He knew how to play on the West's energy cravings and played on their fear of the jihadist threat. He cleverly made himself irreplaceable. He was nevertheless aware of the threat of American interference. They were after all taking place all around him in the last decade. But he may have thought himself safe because he was prepared to make concessions in domestic and foreign policy. But the fate of regime change was soon to strike Libya as well. The eccentric despot was tolerated and smiled at on the outside, but behind closed doors the West was worried. Gaddafi's Libya is too rich in oil and too important as a refugee port to be left to someone who does not play by the Western rule. He showed how little he thinks of these on a grand scale during his first and only speech at the UN. Actually, each speech is limited to 15 minutes. Gaddafi spoke for a whole 100 minutes. In between the sometimes very diffuse statements, he caused the most stir with his harsh criticism of the UN Secretary Council. According to him, it is already unfair and tyrannical in his disposition, as there are five countries that have a veto power over the other countries. Now the Security Council is, is, is a, uh, security feudalism, uh, political feudalism for those who have a permanent seats, protected by, the, by them and they, they are used against them against us. It not, should, should not be called the Security Council, it should be called the Terror Council. This was, of course, a slap in the face of the UN Secretary Council. However, it quickly became clear that the West already had a plan to get rid of the troublesome Gaddafi. In the course of restructuring the political map of the Arab world, Libya was also to be giving a new coat of paint through political engineering. He picked up a piece of paper and he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. 2011 then brought the Arab Spring. The protests began with the revolution in Tunisia and spread across the Arabian Peninsula and further into North Africa. The uprisings were directed against authoritarian and dictatorial regimes and demanded a democratic say. The aim of the protesters was to improve and stabilize the human rights situation. The goal of the Americans who supported the protests, on the other hand, was destabilization and restructuring, a kind of creative destruction. One can imagine that stable human rights cannot be defended in an unstable country. Soon the protests reached Libya. Gaddafi sent his forces into the east of his country, where the uprisings broke out. According to Human Rights Watch, 233 people were killed. The Saudi news channel Al Arabiya spoke of a 10,000 dead. Al Jazeera also reported that the Air Force had dropped bombs on civilians, which was subsequently revealed to be incorrect news. Gaddafi was in fact only firing on the armed rebels, not on civilians as claimed. However, in order to justify NATO intervention, the false casualty figures were accepted without question. On 17th March, 
2011, Libya was declared an international outlaw to the applause of the crowd, for on that day the UN Security Council passed the infamous resolution 1973, which authorized military intervention alongside a no-fly zone by all necessary measures in Libya. What this means included remained undefined. And even though no mandate was ever given to overthrow Gaddafi's regime, NATO interpreted the resolution accordingly. For soon after the bombing began, France and Britain made it publicly clear that the intervention would not end without Gaddafi's overthrow. The goal, according to Obama, was to protect the lives of the peacefully demonstrating protesters from the dictator's violence. According to Obama, Gaddafi was planning a bloodbath in Benghazi, which required immediate intervention. In retrospect, this also turned out to be propaganda. In fact, by the time of the intervention, violence was already on the decline, and the rebels were at the end of their strength. The months after the protests broke out and after a thousand deaths, the conflict was already as good as over. Simply put, the militants were about to lose the war, and so their overseas agents raised the specter of genocide to attract a NATO intervention, which worked like a charm. There is no evidence or reason to believe that Gaddafi had planned or intended to perpetrate a killing campaign. With NATO support behind them, the rebels went from retreat to attack mode. The civil war, which could have been over relatively quickly after six weeks with a thousand casualties, now dragged on for eight months, leaving an estimated 11,500 dead and a divided country. NATO rejected Gaddafi's ceasefire offer. Against the background of protecting Libyan civilians, it would have been obligatory to accept it. After all, Gaddafi was in a position where he could not have refused any concession. It became clear that the mission to protect the pro-democracy protesters and the Libyan population from Gaddafi's troops was a charade. NATO was willing to use any means and inflict collateral damage to remove Gaddafi. On the 20th October 2011, the time had come. The rebels found Gaddafi and Sirte tortured him and finally killed him. The news, as well as the pictures of the bloody corpse, went around the world. The West's cynical joy at the death of the troublemaker was expressed particularly well by Hillary Clinton. Yes, we came, we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs> what remains? Libya is considered a failed state. The rebels raided Gaddafi's armory and the next civil war was not long in coming. Terrorism, which Gaddafi had fought together with NATO in the last decade of his rule, now flourished again. Domino-like, the unrest and weapons also brought terrorism further into Mali, Somalia, Iraq, Gaza, Syria, Niger and Afghanistan. Especially the manned portable air defense system, MANPADS, which in capable hands can be used to shoot down both civilian airlines and military aircraft caused fear. The Arab Spring was now officially over and had turned from a dream of democracy into a nightmare of civil war. The human rights situation in Libya under Gaddafi was bad, but it was made much worse and more dangerous by NATO's intervention. During his 42 years in power, he shaped the country to his will. Both Libya and the world will remember the eccentric dictator and his downfall for a long time. Thank you for watching. If you are interested in more figures from African history, please click here.